and then it visibly mended with some new cell wall material. Now, this has never happened before in nature. The chances for a red algal cell to be snapped on and a vanishing be small. Assume that a dinosaur trod on one, or, or that a browsing creature snapped a filament. Well, the two broken ends would end up a long way away. The only place in the world where they can end up adjacent to each other is on the microscopist's side. So, this is what happens. Here is the damaged cell, and here times 25. Look what happens. These cells, alongside, begin to move in to occupy the empty space. Look at the activity that's going on. Watch this one. It has a sudden burst of activity, as though it's sending information back to the parent body. And so, within 24 hours or so, the entire space has been reoccupied, and they then begin to reduce this, this uh, displacement between the two parts of the broken cell wall. And if we look under the high power microscope, look how the two broken ends are brought together. And this is where it gets really interesting, because there should be no means for them to repair a cell wall in quite this way. Not only are they carefully realigned, but new cell wall, see that? Comes up between. And we end up with the cell built just as it was before. Let's see it again. Here is the cell. It's been cut across with a glass and a steel needle. It's completely broken in half. And yet these cells alongside are at once aware of what has happened. And they begin to move in. They completely reoccupy the broken cell wall. And then using intelligence, this is adapting to an unforeseen uh, event in your environment and responding to it constructively. And under high power, we see how these two little bits of the cell, the cell wall are broke up, which have been broken, are brought back together again. And then between the two, some new cell wall material is produced in order to completely seal the wound. That's intelligence. There is no question about it, ladies and gentlemen. Now watch this. Here is a large ciliated organism, and here is a diatom, which you might think he's going to eat. But watch what happens. He actually sniffs it in some way. He rejects it, but a little bit further along the slide, he comes across a paramecium, which he inspects and woofs it. <laughs> now, when you watch that, is that not exactly like? Is that not exactly like watching uh, a cat catching a mouse? It's exactly the same. It's just the same level of intelligence, of perception, of cognition. And when you watch it doing it, you can see that it is hunting, and you can see that it has devoured what it meant to hunt. That is why, ladies and gentlemen, I am convinced that we should show people these little cells, these little euglenoid cells living in a piece of green pond water. Next time you see some stagnant water, don't think yuck. Think of Brian's uh, lecture, and remember that this is a nice pot that this is what you actually see going on within the pond water. We have, amongst these things, the most incredible communities of immensely complicated creatures. And so with due knowledge, particularly to Sir Andrew Huxley, to Jeremy, and to Hilda Cantalund, um, and above all, to the microbes that have made my talk possible. So never again look at living cells as though they're simple, as though they're uncomplex, as though they're tiny little transistors or little robots or little mechanical devices. These are sentient beings living complicated lives, taking complex decisions, and in my view, unmistakably, showing what the original definition of intelligence defined as intelligent behavior within living cells. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed.